Hello, everybody. So we're in preparation for this live event that is occurring now on Zoom, and it is being followed immediately on Facebook and YouTube. So for anyone who is unable to watch today, we have Facebook and YouTube that are going to be available, not just live right now, but afterward for anyone that wants to see the recordings of these sessions. This is Baha'i Adult Learning every Sunday at 11 a.m. sponsored by the Baha'is of Clearwater, Florida. And what's more, um, Mr. Akeem, uh, would you um, be able to uh, talk a little bit about yourself? Well, uh, my name is Kamran Hakim. Uh, I uh, I am from Iran. I was born in Iran. I came to the United States in 1976 to receive my education and go back. And then the revolution took place, and basically I stayed here. Mm -hmm. uh, got married to someone from my old Sunday school, and it appears that I made the most wonderful choice. We have been married for a long time, and we have uh, three children, three wonderful children, and four grandchildren. Uh, I'm an engineer by background, so uh, in my presentation, probably you are going to get a sense that this guy is an engineer, the way he talks and the way he uh, explains things. Um, um, basically, one of the areas of my interest is philosophy. Uh, and it's specifically the philosophy of the faith and how it interacts with uh, various schools of philosophy that had developed throughout the ages. So as a result, I attempted to put this presentation in the context of that. Um, hopefully people can relate to it and it is of some benefit uh, them. I'm a member of the Baha'i community of Worcester, Massachusetts. I live in Massachusetts. Uh, I've been in Massachusetts for a long time, except for a couple of years that I was in Minnesota. Um, I have been very active in terms of uh, participating on various internet forums for many, many years. I have a lot of communication with different people uh, throughout the United States and, and the world. Uh, discussing issues related to philosophy. And I've had uh, multiple youth uh, groups and meetings where we had uh, done deep dive into various books uh, in uh, Baha'i writings, such as the Book of Certitude, Some Answered Questions, and so on and so forth. So basically, I think that should uh, summarize it for what the, who I am and uh, what I'm all about. Yes, um, it, it definitely does. So for, for those joining us, uh, this is Mr. Kamran Hakim presenting on World Views in Crisis as Humanity Grows from Adolescence into the Age of Maturity, a Baha'i Perspective. Uh, if you are joining and you have friends that are joining, um, please, this is available on clearwaterbahais.org, www.clearwaterbahais.org. This is every Sunday as this pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic continues. Uh, us as a local community in Clearwater have chosen that our uh, community members not go to the Baha'i Center and that uh, a lot of the events that we've been holding uh, we find a way to continue them in this case online. So uh, for those who are joining as long as uh, the Clearwater Baha'i Center the doors remain closed as a result of the coronavirus crisis we are uh, hosting these Sunday discussions, these Sunday uh, Q&A's and presentations. These are available and will be continuing to be available as long as the coronavirus crisis continues. So please share this around with your friends and your family because these uh, presentations are not just um, fruitful, 
they are several of them and we have them on the website clearwaterbahais.org we started this since i think around march and we have compiled a few amazing speakers one of which we're going to be listening to today so um mr akim uh please i would uh, appreciate to ask can you present this presentation it's amazing thank you thank you very much um okay basically uh as the as the subject line explains uh, uh, I tend to believe that we have a crisis in our worldview and the purpose of this presentation is to touch upon basically one of the fundamental worldviews that has had far-reaching implications uh, in human life and it continues to have far-reaching implications in human life so uh, have that in mind. So uh, I'm going to explain exactly what it is that uh, I'm going to be looking at. So Shoghi Effendi uh, compares the human society to a human body and uh, an individual. And basically, uh, he makes certain comparisons between the two. And one of the most interesting comparisons he makes is the transition between adolescent period and the age of maturity of uh, a human being, where every one of us have either experienced it or we are in the process of experiencing it. So we know exactly what it is all about. And basically he says, what is happening in the world is a part and parcel of this transformation that is about to take place. So uh, we need to make sure that we understand that uh, so we can figure out exactly what it is that we are going through. And also we should have a positive outlook because the outcome of this is a positive outcome rather than a negative outcome. And I'm gonna be explaining some stuff here to put this into contrast with the relative mentality of the population at large, where there is a very negative outlook about the future of the world. So uh, as uh, you can see, there are gonna be some growing pains associated with this particular process that Shoghi Effendi describes. So the issue is that uh, we cannot really get rid of them because it's a part and parcel of the process. We need to experience them, but the important point is that we are going to get over that particular uh, issue and uh, we are going to get to the age of maturity and these growing pains are gonna go away. Uh, as a part and parcel of this, I am going to be describing, explaining a worldview that has been used very heavily throughout the world in various cultures and it is continued to be used and I'm going to highlight that one of the fundamental problems that we have today is the fact that we are still using this old worldview. And also I'm going to be presenting a new worldview that has been offered by Baha'u'llah as a replacement for that old uh, worldview. So my expectation from the people who are participating here is not to walk away having that aha moment that I understand. I much rather you walk away with questions and say, what is it that this guy was talking about? Is he out of his mind or is there something that I need to explain? And I think uh, if you walk away with some more questions after this presentation, uh, then I have been successful in what I have attempted to convey. Uh, and if you walk away with saying that, uh, yes, I, I agree with this guy, uh, I, I would recommend that you think twice because it, it is, as far as I'm concerned, if you walk away with more questions, then that is going to open the door to explore that why is he saying what he's trying to say. So having said that, I, I would like to walk you through uh, an experiment that we are going to do with 7.6 billion people. So how do these 7.6 billion people see the world? And it appears to me that uh, the great majority of people have a very grim view 
of what this world is all about and where we are going to be going. So basically, I have broken up this uh, population into uh, two groups, uh, who I'm going to call them religious people and secular people. So there is a table down here, and basically I'm highlighting four religious groups here, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism. And basically these constitute 73% of the population of the planet. I have not even considered the other groups. And there is approximately 14% uh, uh, secular people there. Uh, now, please understand that I am not trying to fit all people into a particular mold and saying that by religiosity, everybody thinks the same. What I am attempting to suggest is that among these 7.6 billion people, there is this 73% factor that somehow or the other, their behavior is influenced by uh, the religion from which they come from. And as a result, whether they know or unknowingly, they behave in such a way that their religion somehow or the other manifests itself in their behavior. And by the, same view, by the same token, I can apply the same principle to the secular point of view and say the same thing about those 14%. Now, having said that, if we go around and interview these people, we are going to come across some very interesting generalizations that perhaps we can consider. And please consider that these are just generalizations. Once again, I'm not trying to put people in, the mold, in one mold. However, uh, for the sake of this discussion that you're having, that is the way I decided to approach it. So you can take it with a grain of salt or uh, you can accept it. That's your choice. So there are a number of people who come from the religious background and they believe that I must suffer in this world in order to fare better in the next. Either it's I'm going to go to heaven, go to a different world, go to paradise, or I'm going to get into my next reincarnation. And if I'm not a good person, I'm going to be basically going downward in my next reincarnation, and so on and so forth. According to the Bible and the Quran, and that is a 53% factor, the world is going to end. Somehow or the other, a number of people believe that eventually what's going to be happening is that all that which we see is going to be ending and something new is going to be built in its place. So what are the fundamental implications, one of the fundamental implications associated with that is that if it is going to end, what is it that I as an individual can do? So just let it be and let's happen whatever that is supposed to be happen happening. Also among these, this group of people, there is going to be a sub category of these people who are going to say that whatever is happening is the fault of devil or the Satan. And basically, as a result of that, I cannot do anything about it. So there is somebody else is causing this. And it is really up to the coming or the appearance of this a Christ figure to solve this mess. And by this Christ figure, so basically, if you go to various religions, they identify either the appearance of Christ, the return of Jesus Christ, the appearance of Sushyans for Zoroastrian religion, the 10th avatar, the 5th Buddha, and so on and so forth. And everybody has a particular name for that individual who is going to come and solve the problems with a magic wand. Of course, that's the mentality. Not that people are going to be working towards something, but something is going to happen that magically things are going to get better. And we are going to land in paradise on Earth. If we talk to the 14% factor, to the uh, people who are coming from a secular point of view, a lot of people are going to be complaining about the condition of life getting worse on a daily basis. Also, they do agree with the religious people that it is someone else's fault that this is happening. However, it is not devil's fault. It is gov governments or corporations or the wealthy who are doing that to me. Uh, there is people are going to feel that they are no longer in control. And the issue is no longer that things are, they have to make a decision between good and bad. They feel that they are in a situation that they have to make decisions between bad and worse. To just give you one example, 
you talk to a lot of people who participate in the election processes, they always complain that the choices that are available to me, they are not really the choices that I want. So I'm going to pick the lesser of the two evils. And that is what I'm referring to here as the bad and worse. So as a result of this, a lot of people are feeling helpless. A lot of people are feeling hopeless and you're falling into the survival mode. And God help us, because when you fall into survival mode, that means that now the law of the jungle is going to be becoming the name of the game and ruling the place. So what is it that is the source of this problem? What is it that causing this problem? So I have attempted to place the blame on our worldview. Uh, going based on what Shoghi Effendi had said, that we are going through this process where we are going out of adolescence and we are getting into a position where we are going to attain maturity. Naturally, in the time that we are in adolescence, we have had certain worldviews, we have had certain ways that we have looked at the world, as a result of which there are certain boundaries have been defined in the way that we are behaving. So what are these worldviews? If you look at a human being, basically as a biological computer, behaves very similar way to computers. In computers, basically, you've got these tables of truth where the logic of the situation is going to define how the computer is going to behave. So as a result of the logic table, AND gate and the NAND gate, OR gate and the NOR gates, you can define the behavior of the computer. Within a human being as a biological computer, there is a hierarchy of values that dictates the same, which results in the behavior of the individual. Like anything else in life, the heavier elements always settle down and the lighter elements go on the top. So you look at planet Earth, on planet Earth, we'll find that the solid material forms the surface of the planet, water sits on the top, and then the atmosphere is going to become the outer shell. Our values that we have within us, that we have gathered, are basically the same. There are certain values that we have that are weightier and heavier than the rest, and they will settle down on the bottom of this pyramid of the hierarchy of values and then the lighter ones go on the top. So I'm gonna just give you one example. Let's assume that Qumran, Qumran's behavior is dictated by two completely different sets of values in his life. Those values are thirst for power on one hand and having moral values on the other. Now, I am suggesting based on these hierarchy of values that if my moral values are weightier in my life and you're setting on the foundation and my thirst for power is on a lighter side and it's sitting on the top, then what I will do in my life is going to be regulated by, that, by the weightier set of values that I have in the hierarchy of my values. So as a result, it is my moral values that are going to be dictating. So I'm willing to overcome my thirst for power and money and success in order to ensure that my moral values are going to be standing strong in my life. On the other hand, I could take the other path and money and power and success could be given a higher weight in my life. So as a result, even though I do have moral values, as a result, if I get to a point that I have to make a choice between the two, it is the, my thirst for power that is going to dictate and ultimately I am going to step on my moral values in order to gain that which I want. Now, these hierarchy of values that I just talked about, basically they come from various attitudes and ideologies and philosophies and religious beliefs that we come across as children or as adults within the environment that we live in, and some of which are absorbed from the environment as environmental factor, and we accept them, and we absorb them without truly understanding what it is that we have accepted, 
and then they automatically become a part and parcel of our behavior. And there are other things that we accept by our own will and they become manifest in our lives. So as a result, uh, there are certain of these values that uh, we are aware of and there are certain that we might not. And I'm gonna give you a couple of, a couple of examples. A person might be quite aware of the fact that you are truthful. Or on the other side, a person could be an about capitalist. That is their value in life. So as a result, that is how they are gonna behave. They are very well aware of that. There are some other values that might not be as apparent. For example, some prejudices. A person might have a racial prejudice. They may or may not be aware of the fact that they have racial prejudice. They have to come across interacting with the people of other races in order to get to understand whether they are racially prejudiced or not. And in some cases, it goes completely unnoticed and they behave in such a way without ever realizing that. And some people do realize and they push for it and they go in that particular path that they want. Now, among these worldviews that have played an important role in human life are some of the things that have been mentioned by Plato. Plato is one of the philosophers uh, of ancient Greece, and he has played a major role in some of the things that have happened throughout the world because his teachings have basically been studied to the nth degree and they have been emulated in various fields uh, extending from political science to social science to psychology and so on and so forth. So having said that, I would like to highlight one such a teaching that comes out of Plato's Republic, where he discusses one allegory, which is called the allegory of the chariot. And that is going to be the subject of our discussion because it's, in my opinion, it has played such a crucial and fundamental role in human life. Uh, so basically, this particular allegory describes the human nature at two different levels, both at a personal level and at a societal level. So at a micro level and at a macro level. And I will put that into uh, discussion as we move forward. Now, before doing that, I would like to describe uh, this, what this allegory of the chariot is. So as you can see in this picture, uh, this allegory of chariot is made out of two horses. So, so basically we are dealing with two Pegasus. Uh, these are the two winged horses. One of them is white, one of them is dark. And then there is the chariot itself, and then there is a charioteer. So these two horses are basically the motive force for this chariot and allow the chariot to move forward. And then the person who is the charioteer, it represents the reason. So between the two horses, one of whom represents the spirit, the other one, the appetites, uh, and then the charioteer represents the reason. Uh, from the point of view of uh, Plato, uh, a human being is made out of three elements, basically. The human soul is made out of three elements, uh, one of which is reason, one, and the other one is the spirit, the human spirit, and the other one are the human appetites. Now, as you can see, he refers to the human soul having three uh, parts. However, if we look at philosophy at large, we will see that the term soul has two separate meanings. One as the entity that has these different characteristics within which resides the spirit and the reason and the appetites. And also the term soul has been used by various writers as that lower nature of a human being from which the appetites become manifest. So given the fact that both characterizations exist, uh, throughout the history, I included both of them there. So please understand that by the name, by the term soul, I mean two different things, both appetites as well as the entity that describes the whole thing of uh, reason, spirit, and appetites. So having said that, 
uh, this allegory of the chariot has one single uh, outcome or the ultimate meaning, and that is that the soul is going to be most fruitful and the soul is going to be a most free and functioning in its best if reason is going to be in control. Now, we, please understand that we are talking about the individual here, in the life of an individual. So having said that, now I would like to look at this allegory of the chariot from the point of its characteristic, both at a personal level and at a, at, at a uh, societal level, at a micro level and at a macro level. And then look at the characteristics and the outcomes. Please accept my apologies for this page have, having so many uh, pieces of information in there. Uh, you can later on basically go through and read uh, through it. If there are any questions, I will be very happy to answer your question either in this meeting or you can send me an email and I will be very happy to uh, have a conversation with you outside of this meeting. So at a micro level, basically this chariot of, uh, this allegory of the chariot defines a person in a very one dimensional way. So either I as an individual am a person who is driven by reason, by my spirit or by my appetites. And as a result of that, I become who I am. And the highest degree of attainment in my life would be if somehow or the other, I can have my mind to become the controller of all my behavior. So what are the outcomes of this? What are the implications of this? So in order to conform to this particular point of view, it turns out that we are going to uh, end up in a follower type of mentality. Now, you might ask, what is it that you mean by this follower mentality, Conrad? And that is extremely important for you to uh, try to understand uh, what the implication of that is. This follower mentality is that basically as an individual, when they mold me into either as a thinker or as a spirited person or as a person driven by um, my appetites, then I have to follow the implications and the outcomes that are associated with that particular mold that has been imposed upon me. The best way to look at that is look at the look throughout the history. Uh, some people uh, come from families where the parents were, the father was a doctor, the son became a doctor too. The father was a builder, the son became a builder. The father was into uh, philosophical writings, the son did the same thing. If you look at, for example, throughout other countries, uh, you go through India, for example, where people uh, are in various caste systems, uh, you will see that still in various echelons of the society, basically individual is bound to follow the particular mold that they have been put into. So as a result of that, uh, we, will, we will see the implications of that throughout the world. Another one of these is the uh, religious beliefs that we have. We come from, if for example, Qumran was born into a Hindu family, I would have been sitting here in front of you and talking to you as a Hindu. If I was born in a Muslim family, chances are extremely high that I would have been sitting here and speaking to you as a Muslim and so on and so forth. So one of the implications of this is that the door remains wide open for abuse. And I think we can see that when we are going to start looking at this at a macro level. So at a macro level, if you look at the characteristics, the appetites and the spirit exert different degrees of influence throughout the society. And as a result of that, we have become stratified into different layers in the society. So those who are driven by reason, they become the guardians. Those are the 
driven by the spirit become the auxiliaries, and those who are driven by appetites, those become the producers. So as a result, you, in, the, in the society, you either have leaders or rulers or kings, you're going to have the soldiers and the police, and these are just examples that I'm giving. The examples go well beyond what they have described here. And if you are driven by your appetites, you become a laborer or an artisan and so on and so forth. So the highest degree of cultural and spiritual attainments within this framework is when you have the guardians or the shepherds to direct people to go to a particular direction. So we can have the best outcome as a result, as a part and parcel of that. So at a micro level, basically a human guardian physically is going to be controlling the masses. I'm going to give you some examples. If you're living under a monarchical system, it's the monarch who is becoming the charioteer and pushing an entire nation towards a particular direction. If you're living in a religious society, it's the religious leader who becomes the charioteer. Just a fundamental example of that is look at Iran today, where we have the grand charioteer, as an ayatollah is running the country, and then you've got the lower charioteers who are pushing people in various directions, depending on their point of view of how a person should be living. A husband in this model emerges as the charioteer of his wife, and I'm giving you two examples here. Uh, for example, if you look at Christianity, uh, Paul, indicated that men, uh, Paul indicated that a husband is the head of his wife and head is basically the center from which the reason and the mind emanate. And in Islam, for example, men have been defined as the protectors and the maintainers of women. I would like to make sure that you're not going to walk away to take these two examples that I have given as examples that I'm attempting to put down these two religions. Far from it, that is not, that is not the point. I, I just simply use these as an examples for you to see that how far reaching is this methodology that was established by Plato in his allegory and how this allegory was adopted into a religion that appeared 2000 years ago. Plato lived somewhere around 2500 years ago so Christianity adopts this, and in the context of this particular understanding of the time, represents a view that fell inside of this particular mode. Or in Islam, a view has been represented in regards to men being the protectors and the maintainers of women that falls within this particular mold and this particular model. So there is no idea, no thoughts about putting down. I'm just trying to give you an example that how influential the view of uh, Plato was that even in religious text, the model was used in order to derive meaning from it for people to be able to understand. Now, I provided here some examples that you can see in physically. However, the more dangerous ones come from philosophical and ideological guardians. So, for example, from a philosophical point of view, we have got communism. We have got other various schools of thought that describe the way a philosophically how a person should be behaving. One of which is, for example, the supremacy of a given race. For example, people have found in schools of philosophy that supremacy of a given race is the name of the game. So as a result, that is the methodology that I want to use and I want to follow. And that really follows, and it is in completely in tune with what Plato had described. In, in regards to ideologies, we can see supreme examples of that today. Look at United States of America. For example, the political parties that we have in the United States of America, these are ideologies that are basically have become the charioteers that are basically controlling the masses and pushing them to go towards a particular direction. So having said that, operating in accordance to this particular worldview is going to have certain shortcomings. 
And the reason that there is going to be a certain shortcoming is because reason has been identified as the controlling factor. And I am going to present in the next slide why there is a shortcoming associated with that. So the question is, is reason in and by itself an appropriate criterion of judgment? And the answer to that is a resounding no. According to Plato, reason rules by looking out for the good of the soul as a whole. Now, this is an extremely true, true statement. If we are going to look at a human being as the most intelligent animal, it is the human mind that is the supreme factor in the life of a human being. That is the sole thing that has been able to distinguish a human being above all other beings and has been the builder of all the civilizations that we have had, all the sciences that we have had. So as a result, what Plato is saying is a true statement. Reason is looking for the good of the soul. It is because of the reason that we have been able to build our sciences. It's the, because of reason that we have been able to build all these various different things that we have built today. So as a result, it is a good thing. However, this statement is true at a personal level and it, is, it doesn't really apply to the way that we want it as a societal level. And the reason for that is because there is a distinction between good and bad and right and wrong. If you go out there and ask 100 people that if there is a difference between good and bad and right and wrong, 99 people are going to say that they are synonyms of, each, of one another. And yet that is wrong. It is categorically wrong because good and bad is a personal thing. Right and wrong is a collective thing. Good and bad has its yardstick within the mind of the individual. So the person is the center of the universe. So good and bad are decided relative to what is good and what is bad for the individual. Right and wrong has its yardstick somewhere else. And everybody has to look at that yardstick in order to be able to make the judgment whether something is right and wrong. So to give you an example, moral values fall under right and wrong methodology. So the, the yardstick becomes the manifestation of God who has defined what is right and what is wrong. So as a result, masses make the decision in regards to what is right and what is wrong without referring to themselves as being the center of the universe. Now in, re in regards to good and bad, for example, I go and buy some stocks. The price of the stocks go up today. So as a result, if I sell it today, if I decide to sell it, I'm going to make a lot of money. So it's good. Hallelujah and praise the Lord. However, if I make a choice that I am not going to sell that today and I'm going to wait until tomorrow, bad news is going to come somehow or the other. The company is going to publish a bad news and the price of the stock is going to go up. So tomorrow, the price of the stock is going to go down. So that which was good today is going to be bad tomorrow. That which was good for me today is going to be bad for me tomorrow. So you see good and bad are relative to the individual and they are going to be changing by time. Right and wrong are going to be relative to uh, something more than one, to an entity which is more than one. And it is going to have a much longer lasting implication. I'm going to give you one more example. I'm spending some time here because this is extremely important. So consider me as an individual. I can make all sorts of decisions in my individual life as a single person. I can come home as late as I want. I can sleep as long as I want. I can choose whether I want to work or not. It is me, I am the center of the universe of my life, and I can choose exactly what it is that I want to do. Now, imagine at some point I'm going to get a, make a decision that I am going to get married. Now, imagine that I am going to continue doing what I was doing as a single person. Then I am going to be faced with the wrath of my wife because now another individual has come in 
the singularity that was defined as me as a single person has turned into a singularity of a family as a couple, a husband and a wife. Now, if I behave based on good and bad that I had defined based on me being the center of the universe, that is going to become the poison for the singularity that we call life of a couple as a family, and that is no longer going to work. So the good and bad that was good and bad for me is no longer, can no longer be good and bad for us as a couple. We need to have some type of a methodology of right and wrong that both of us can refer to. Now I'm going to make it a little bit harder. The imagine, imagine children are going to come in. And now whatever decision that I used to make as an individual or most my wife and I could, could have, would have made as a couple is no longer going to be valid as good and bad because children are in there. We, we need to consider their rights as well. So as a result, you see the concept of good and bad are going to change. Now imagine I have said, I have given you this example. Now imagine you put these billions of people throughout the world and you allow them to operate based on the notion of good and bad. The good and bad for every individual is going to vary. Now people in order to solve that, now they have consider bringing the guardians and the guardians define for the masses what is good and bad which is the product of their own minds and those good and bad are going to become diametrically opposite with the good and bad of another guardian or another religious leader or another president or another monarch and as a result we are in a mess that we are in now so one of the fundamental problems that exist with this particular worldview that I, am, I have chosen to discuss here is that it is based on the assumption that good and bad is equal to right and wrong, and it is categorically false, unless I am a single person living on the surface of this planet, and that is not the case. So while this equation is going to stay correct at a personal level, it definitely breaks down at a collective level. Now you might say, what was Plato out of his mind? Why did he recommend such a thing? Actually, he wasn't out of his mind. He recommended this for the stage of the development of humanity, which according to Shoghi Effendi was the stage of childhood. And it has brought us to the stage of adolescence. Throughout the stage of childhood, it was necessary for someone to tell humanity and the members of the human race or the members of the society what is right and what is wrong. Because the same way that parents guide their children. However, we have reached to a point that this model no longer applies. So I am not by any means putting down Plato here. What Plato had done was wonderful in terms of modeling how a human behaved. However, that model applied to that particular time frame. For those who are scientifically minded, engineering background, background in medicine and so on and so forth, you will come across a very similar situation in scientific cases and engineering cases where we have had models that work within a certain set of constraints. However, as we increase those constraints, we need to change the model in order to be able to make it more relevant. And I'm going to have more discussion of that later on. Now, having said that, in order to bring this into uh, some type of a sense, I am going to uh, share with you a statement that was made by Abdul Baha on the eve of the First World War. As you know, Abdul Baha traveled to the United States and he delivered talks uh, at various places uh, from the East Coast to the West Coast. In one of the speeches that he gave in New York City in 1912, he made the following statement, man is submerged in the affairs of this world. His aims, object, objects, and attainments are mortal, whereas God desires for him immortal accomplishments. In his heart, there is no thought of God. 
he has sacrificed his portion and birthright of divine spirituality. Desire and passion, like two unmanageable horses, have wrestled the reins of control from him and are galloping madly in the wilderness. This is the cause of the degradation of the world of humanity. This is the cause of retrogression into the appetites and passions of the animal kingdom. Now this desire and passion that he's talking about are those two horses that we talked about, the spirit and uh, the soul, uh, the spirits and the appetite. Desires translates into the appetites of the soul, passions, translates into the spirit or the white horse. And then he refers to them as the two unmanageable horses and the reins of control from him. He is talking about the charioteer here and they are galloping madly in the wilderness. Now he's referring to the world, the situation of the world right on the eve of the first world war. And he's comparing it to the wilderness. Basically, a society is described by him as wilderness, implying lack of cultivation, where the survival of the fittest basically is running, is the name of the game. So, and that was the reason that basically uh, we went through what we experienced and so many people got killed. And that wasn't enough, we went through a second one. Uh, God help us if we have to go through another one. <clears throat> so beyond the allegory of the chariots, now I'm going to get back to the example that I was going to give you. If we look at science, we'll find out that science at some point was based on observation alone. So you go and read some of the ancient books of science, you will see that people made observations. Based on those observations, they put them down as science, and that was the science of the time. So for example, somebody looked at the sky and saw the sun rising from the east and setting in the west, so they made an assumption that it is the sun that is moving around the earth without any, uh, uh, you know, being, giving second thoughts about it. That's what was happening. So that was the reality. So the world was defined as the center of the universe as something that is sitting constantly at the center and the sun is rotating around the, around the earth. And that was basically the name of the game for a while. After a certain period, of time that proved to be inadequate at some point people started said that that is not good we should go to reason and they started looking at reason and then there was quite a bit of disagreement from one group of scientists who use their reason compared to another group of scientists who use their reasons and finally they came up with the idea that in order to have good science we need to merge both theory and observation we need to merge reason and sense perception. That which you see, that which you hear, need to be merged with your reason in order to be able to come up with sound scientific models that work. And that is when science started taking off because it started on two criteria of judgment rather than one. For many years, this was the foundation of science and, and classical physics basically moved forward based on that until we got to a point where the models that have been presented in the science did not really address every aspect of what we needed to know. So as a result of that, the theory of relativity came about. Basically, Einstein looked outside of the box that the old science, the classical physics had defined and looked, started looking at things in a completely different way. And as a result of that, we came up with the theory of modern physics, which actually propelled science to even higher degrees of accomplishment. If we look at philosophy, we will find that in philosophy, a very similar path was taken, where ancient philosophers followed basically the same idea. Either they decided on making observations based on uh, either rationalization or observations, and they had their models presented. And then later on, we come across Descartes, who came up with the idea of describing things uh, in a mechanistic way. So Descartes actually was perhaps one of the greatest philosophers 
uh, that appeared in more recent times. And after that, other philosophers basically made very minor contributions, but Descartes had one of the most major contributions that was ever made to philosophy. However, the point I'm attempting to make is that the same way that uh, Descartes made those major modifications, additional mutations or additional great changes in philosophy are necessary in order to be able to make changes to the existing uh, philosophical models that become more applicable in today's life. So there are a few takeaways here that I would like you to pay attention. The original reaction to the new, new theory of relativity was skepticism. So when Einstein presented his view, all the scientists, they, they really arose against him. They really didn't like what he had to say. So they subjected what he said to the uh, falsification principle, which was actually a blessing because ultimately that falsification principle brings, brought them to a point that they had nothing else but to accept the theory that he had uh, uh, advanced. And even to this state, we are still proving the basis of the science that he advocated. For example, the black hole theory just recently that was put together uh, in terms of a physical way of looking at the black hole uh, is really one of the outcomes of the theory of relativity that he, he had brought up. So it continues to be uh, proven today. So one of the things that I would like to pay your attention to is this a statement of Abdul Baha here that scientific knowledge is the highest attainment of the human in the human plane. So basically, without going through the readings of this, he is basically suggesting that uh, we have put a lot of efforts into the scientific knowledge that deals with the material on the material side of things. And as a result of that, we have come across great attainments. And he is recommending that there is a sister form of science associated to this material science, which he calls divine science. And he is begging us to pay attention to that as well. Because at this point, scientists are basically laughing at that. And they are saying that this is not important. That is basically childish games. And we, are, we should leave that uh, to philosophers just to fill the pages of books. And Abdul Baha is saying that you really need to start paying attention to that. These divine science is something that is going to be important. It's going to have far reaching implications in your lives. And he expects us the same way that we subjected the material science to the falsification principle. We take this divine science that he's talking about and subject it to the falsification principles because then and only then, we are going to have a situation where we can see the reality after we have attempted to disprove it. And then he presents these two as two wings of a bird that allow the human reality to be able to ascend well beyond uh, where it is today. Now, having said that, now I would like to present the new model that has been advocated by Baha'u'llah, which is the allegory of the bird. This is, in reality, a replacement for the allegory of the chariot. And basically, similar to the Plutonic description, the Baha'i worldview is also based on a triad of a spirit, mind, and the soul. However, there are fundamental differences in the way that these three are described. Throughout Baha'i writings, Abdul Baha describes the, uh, the spirit, mind, and the soul in different ways. For example, you've come across that in some answered questions in the Paris talks. One of the most more meaningful ones appear in the Star of the West, where he describes the uh, mind, soul, and the spirit in a very unique way. And basically, he uh, describes a pure essence whose identity is unknown. And then that human reality that he describes here, now he says that if 
that human reality or that pure essence manifests itself as a thinker within a human being, we refer to it as the mind. If it represents itself as the controller, uh, controller of the body, we refer to it as the soul. And if it submits itself to the manifestation of God and becomes and it begins to swim in the world of God, then it becomes the spirit. So it's a very unique description of these three entities. And I found this to be quite meaningful relative to this particular model. As a result, I chose that to present here. And then Abdullah goes on to say, once a bird hath grown its wing, it remaineth on the ground no more, but soareth upward into the high heaven, except for those birds that are tied by the leg or those whose wings are broken or mired down. So there are some points of similarities between these two models, and there are so, uh, some areas of distinction between the two. From the points of similarity, there are, there are two motive forces that are described in both models. There are two horses in the uh, model of the chariot, allegory of the chariot. So there are also, there are two dual motive forces uh, in the allegory of the bird in the form of a wing. There is, as far as the differences are concerned, basically you are dealing with a setup where you are, you have a system, it is plural, there are, it has three different elements. And the, in the case of the model of the bird, it's a singular. It is the entirety is a bird. It's, uh, it is not different entities coming together in order to form the allegory. Uh, so in the allegory of the <coughs> chariot, the motive forces, both of them are emotional. You need reason as an entity separate from the other two in order to be able to control that. However, in the case of the allegory of the bird, the one motive force is national, the other, other one is emotional. So basically you are attempting to reach a balance between the two motive forces, one of whom, one of whom is rational, the other one is uh, em emotional or spiritual. On the older model, reason is the controller. In the new model, control is based on rational and emotional factor by the pure essence. So uh, it's a very different way that you are controlling. <clears throat> the appetites and the soul uh, effect, affected as the motive force. So basically, uh, it is the attainments or it, it is what the soul does that is going to impact how fast the uh, these the horses are going to be moving. However, in this case, it is the mind and the spirits that are going to allow the bird to fly. Uh, I can probably go through a lot of examples here uh, in order to describe the differences between the two. Uh, there are many other ex examples that could describe the differences between the two that are fundamentally different, drastically different, and they completely imply a different picture. So I really want you to uh, conduct that study by yourself to see how this new model really changes the way things work out. So having said that, I would like to also describe the implications of this new worldview. We described the same for the old worldview. At a micro level, the allegory of the bird is describing the fact that the life of the individual is no longer a one dimensional entity. You are not driven either by reason or by your spirit or by your appetites. The life of an individual is regulated by two wings, a rational and a spiritual. So we have a, we have a two dimensional life. One dimension is physical, reasonable, and the other dimension is the spiritual. <clears throat> and every human being is going to be behaving in accordance to the degree of influence each one of these are going to be playing. 
So having said that, now let's look at the expected outcome. The re regressive following mentality that we associated with the, uh, with the old model, now it's going to become progressive in the sense that the individual no longer needs to have a follower mentality. The individual transforms to have a leader mentality here because the individual going to be in control, both reason and spirituality, both the rational wing as well as the spiritual dimension are going to provide the individual to be able to behave in a variety of ways, in different ways and make choices. Life is no longer one dimension. In this model, independent investigation of truth, over choosing the path of least resistance or blindly following others is going to become a more important factor, is going to become the name of the game. Individual is going to have a better chance for making more robust choices. Individual is going to have a better chance to making, making more balanced choices since decisions <clears throat> are going to be based on rational and spiritual principle. I'm going to take you back to science. If you remember, I gave you an example that when once science was based on observation alone and, and another time it was based on reason alone. However, when science became <clears throat> a part and both observation as well as reason became a part and parcel of the foundation of the science, then science started to fly higher and higher. Science became more and more useful and more and more uh, applicable to human life. The same thing is true here. Now we are telling the individual, no longer you're relying on either being molded into a reasonable person or a spirited person or an appetitive person. Now you have you can rely on two factors of reason and spirituality, rationality and spirituality, and then the different worlds are going to become unfurled. Different options are going to become unfurled. At a macro level, the human interaction is going to be self-regulated versus being controlled by the outside factor. If you remember in the uh, allegory of the chariot, it is the charioteer that is going to be controlling the masses. However, in this case, it is the individual who is going to be the leader in their own life. So as a result, when somebody is going to come and say that this is what you should be doing, a person is going to be in a much better position in order to be able to make the right choices rather than following blindly what someone else is asking them to do. Human interaction is going to be governed by two criteria of judgment, and these are going to have moderating effect on one another. However, if you are gonna go by reason alone or by a spirituality alone, the door is gonna be wide open. Abdul Baha refers to that in one of his talks, and he says that if we go by the wing of science or wing of rationality, there is a possibility that we are going to fall into the quagmire of materialism. And if you go by the wing of spirituality alone, then the door is going to be wide open for you to fall into the uh, area where you are going to just make choices that uh, might not be uh, the right choices you make. Because spirituality by itself does not have the set of characteristics you can become, uh, you can make emotional choices that are not correct. So basically, progress is going to depend uh, on a form of education which allows for each side to develop. So basically, we are dealing with living in a world where we have allowed material sciences to grow very strong. However, spiritual sciences have not grown as strong. So if we bring these two together, basically the birth of humanity, the birth of the society can start going 
to highest degrees of cultural and spiritual achievements. So at a macro level, the expected outcomes are going to be, uh, I can give a few examples, the male members of the society would cast off their guardianship role towards female members of their, in their relationship. And there will be no need for religious leaders to serve as centers of imitation. So for example, if you go back to my country in Iran, religious leaders are the centers of imitation. That is where people have to look at them and follow them. In the Baha'i faith, we are supposed to be turning within and we are supposed to be following that which the wing of spirituality and that which the wing of science is telling us in order to be able to come up with the best effective solution in order to address our needs. So basically religion and science are going to have moderating effect on one another. And this is what I was attempting to, to say, Abdul Baha's quote is here, should a man try to fly with the wing of religion alone, he would fall into the quagmire of superstition. Whilst on the other hand, if flies on the wing of science, he would also make progress, but fall into the despairing slot of materialism. So in reality, you are dealing with a situation where it is very necessary for us to be able to have the moderating effect of the two. In science, for example, there is this moderation that takes place based on observation and theory. As the two moderate one another, then formulas, models emerge that purely and clearly describe what the situation is. So according to Abdul Daha, there are four criteria of judgment. This is a description that Abdul Daha offered in Green Nature Baha'i School uh, in Maine in about 1912. Now, basically, I'm going to give you a jump up summary of this. Uh, he says that there are basically four criteria of judgment available to a human being, criterion of the senses, that is what you can hear, what you can see, what you can smell, what you can taste. There is another criteria of judgment, it's called the criteria of the intellect or reason. There is a third one, which is the traditional or scriptural. All of us come from various religious backgrounds where the religious books that we believe in uh, are going to dictate how we should be making judgment about that which is around us in the world. And then also he refers to another standard of judgment, which is the standard of inspiration. Some people call that gut feeling. Sometimes you come across, you meet a person for the very first time, and you have a gut feeling about that individual. You have a good feeling or you have a negative feeling. And it turns out that there is certain amount of validity associated with that. Now, Abdul Baha describes that none of these criteria of judgment that he's describing here in and by themselves are reliable sources. And then he gives an example. He says, you're walking on a desert, in a desert, and you see a mirage. And this is your eyes are basically, basically making a mistake. It is not reality. So you cannot really rely on that which the eyes see. You look at the sky. The sun is turning around the earth but that's not the reality. So as a result, you cannot really rely on that which you see by itself. You cannot also, according to him, rely on the concept of intellect alone. And his, his reasoning is that if intellect was a good criteria in and by itself, the philosophers of Rome, Persia, Egypt, India, so on and so forth, everyone should have reached the same conclusion. And that is not the case. So we cannot rely on reason alone by itself. You cannot also rely on the scriptural authority because it is understood by the virtue of intellect. You go and read the books, you listen to what your religious leader is telling you, but who is there to tell you what you have understood is the correct understanding. So as a result, in and by itself, it could be wrong. And the fourth standard is the inspiration. And he argues that if you receive an inspiration, do you, is it because of your selfish attitude that exists within you or is it truly a divine inspiration that you have received so you cannot really make that judgment which one it is uh, that is uh, the source of that 
And then somebody asked him, so how, how are we, how are we going to make the right decision? And he says, if you come up with a solution that is sensible, it is reasonable, it is supported by scriptural authority, and you have a good feeling about it, then you can rely on it. Now, this is a very interesting approach that Abdullah is making. I just want to take your attention to the field of science. In science, we used to make judgments based on the criterion of the senses alone, and we made a lot of mistake in our science. Then we decided to go with the path of intellect alone. We made models that were not sound enough. Then we decided to merge these two together, and we came up with solid science. So science is based on these two criteria of judgment. And that's why that it has been so useful. Now, these other two criteria that we're talking about, this has to do with spiritual science. This has to do with material science, these two. This has to do with spiritual science. So in Baha'i faith, Abdul Baha is suggesting that number one, you should have a scientific approach to that which you accept or that which you attempt to convey to others. And on the top of that, he is even making it more stringent. He says that which you are either understanding or you're attempting to convey to another person from a scientific point of view, it should be moderated by the virtue of the spiritual science that he describes by the virtue of these two. And he says, if these four can merge together, you can come up with a moderate answer. You can come up with a perfect answer that you can rely on. So this is the criteria by which an individual could make the best judgment. Now you, you might come up and say, come on, are you, are you out of your mind? There are some people who, have, who are extremely educated. They have gone to a school and they can make judgments like this. And there are some people who have not gone to a school. How, how are they going to make judgments? Actually, it turns out that these four paths that Abdul Baha has described is going to be just as helpful to a professor of a university with all the knowledge that he has and a person and a cleaning lady who is probably who has studied no more than sixth grade or eighth grade of uh, schooling because these people are in completely different worlds but nevertheless all of them rely on their that which they see that is their experiences. All of these people, both of these people rely on their intellect. The professor of a university has the intellect to make a judgment in regards to that which they are facing. And the cleaning lady or the cleaning person who is, has six grades of education, they have their intellect, which is pretty robust in regards to making reasonable judgments. And all of these people do have their religious beliefs, they do have their sense of inspiration. So within their own sphere of understanding, they are going to be able to use these four criteria of judgment to make better choices. So Abdul Baha's argument applies to the most educated person and the, to the least educated person by indicating that if you choose these four criteria of judgment and you impose the four criteria on the final outcome, on the final decision, you are going to be able to make a more robust decision. So as far as I'm concerned, the professor of a university can use these four from his or her own point of view and come up with the best decision that he or she can make. And the cleaning person with the limited education that they have, they can use the four criteria of judgment to make the best possible decision within their framework. Now, to put this in contrast with what is happening in the world, we are living in a world where people are watching TV and based on what they see, criterion of senses, they make their judgment if a person is a good person or a bad person. Based on what they hear, they make intellectual judgments whether something is right or wrong based on somebody that the religious leader is telling them or their churches are telling them, they make a judgment whether something, they should do something or they should not do something. And sometimes God's feelings are not even paid attention to. So we've got confused groups of people that are making decisions that 
might be erroneous because they are not making the right decision. And you, you might tell me, Conan, are you out of your mind? Who are you to make the judgment that people are making the right decision or wrong decision? Now, I'm going to tell you what. Decisions should be made based on knowledge, not based on information. Think about it. If you see something on TV, if you read something for the first time, this is information you're receiving. This is not knowledge. Knowledge is when you receive something and that has been digested and has been turned into knowledge. In majority of cases, people have a knee-jerk reaction to that which they hear or that which they think they understand. So you're reacting in majority of cases to information. And that is the that is the reason that we are bound to make wrong judgments. Don't forget, we are living in an era that is called information age. It is not a knowledge age. People go to internet in order to gain their knowledge. They are missing the point. What they are gaining from the internet is information. It is not knowledge. You can call it knowledge if you subject it to these four criteria of judgment. You can call it knowledge if you start thinking, you contemplate on that which you have received, you have read on the internet. Now, having said that, I am going to make my conclusionary remarks. Now, we have discussed here an expansion of our worldview. The worldview that we had was an old worldview. It was a wonderful worldview. It served us well during the childhood uh, level of our growth and development of humanity. The question is, is it serving us today? As far as I'm concerned, the answer is no. But who am I to tell you whether you should accept that or not? That is, the monkey is on your back to go and determine for yourself. The most that we can achieve in this world, new, old worldview is to reach out and hold one another's hand. Now, we come across a lot of situations where people, because they are open-minded, they are recognizing issues related to sexism, racism, and all sorts of other forms of ism that we come across. But given the fact that we are open-minded, we are extending our hand outside of the boundaries that are defined by our worldviews, and we are holding our neighbor's hand or the hands of someone from a different color or a different race or a different language or a different religion. And then we think in our mind, that we have been able to overcome the problem. I am attempting to point out that no, we have taken the first step. We haven't overcome anything. Holding someone else's hand, that doesn't translate into overcoming the barriers. You can overcome the barriers if you break these walls. These walls are basically the worldviews that are holding you within. We need a larger worldview. And that larger worldview is the type of worldview that is going to allow us to be able to actually embrace one another. These two people cannot embrace one another. The most they can do is hold each other's hand. This is the condition where you can embrace one another. Okay, now I would like to uh, share with you a quotation from Shoghi Effendi. Now I have removed some areas of this quotation and I have put ellipsis next to it because I, am, I wanted to generalize the quotation. This quotation has to do with racism. It has to do with the issue of the racial tension that exists between black and white, in particularly in the United States. So I took out the verbiage that had to do with that in order to be able to generalize it. So please accept my apologies for doing so, but I'm just letting you know that what it is that 
is happening here. Now, since I've got this uh, thing here and I cannot read the whole quotation, I'm gonna get out of this particular mode so I can basically bring this up a little bit and I shouldn't have done that. Okay, so hold on a second. Let me make this a little bit too slower because I wanna be able to read this. So what is this quotation telling us? Shoghi Effendi says, to abandon once and for all the usually in inherent and at times subconscious sense of superiority. Now he is referring to these two groups, as I said, this is a quotation that has to do with uh, the two races, the white race and uh, the uh, black race. So to abandon once and for all, usually inherent and at times subconscious sense of superiority to correct their tendency towards revealing a patronizing attitude, to persuade them through their intimate, spontaneous, and informal association with them of genuineness of their friendship and sincerity of their intention and master their impatience of any lack of responsiveness on the part of the people who have received for so long a period such a grievous and a slow healing wound. And for those who were among the oppressed, he says, though a corresponding effort, through a corresponding effort on their part, show by every means in their power the warmth of their response, their readiness to forget the past, their ability to wipe out every trace of suspicion that may still linger in their hearts and minds. Now, please pay attention to this particular uh, statement that he is making here. Informal association with them, genuineness of their friendship and sincerity of their intention. And he's talking about intimate a spontaneous and informal association. I wanna go back to this picture that I have here. Within this old model that is operating in our, within our psyche, each one of us have these worldviews. If we retain these worldviews, do, do you really think that we are gonna be able to have this intimate, spontaneous and informal association? Or are we just gonna extend our hand and hold the hand of other person? only way that is possible if these barriers are lifted and we go all of us go inside of this area so we can embrace one another now this was supposed to be end of my presentation however uh, one of the things that really uh, I, I want to make sure that I, I talk about here this is going to be extremely important is the two examples that I have put in here and these are just I want you to pay attention to this. This is a picture of the same individual that has been taken. This is basic photography. Now I can put on my lens different filters and I can take different pictures of that same individual. Now see if I put a filter and I try to pay more attention to the infrared region of the spectrum, you can see that the picture comes out to be very weird. Also, if I take the picture to the ultraviolet regime, actually a number of freckles come up that the person who, whose picture I'm presenting might not be really fond of, that does not want to, to be seen. As far as we are concerned, beauty is described by this middle picture. But what is this middle picture? This middle picture, is the white light, is the visible light, which is, has a wide range of a spectrum of wavelengths. What I'm attempting to describe here is the type of isms that we as human beings are imposing on the population. So for example, when we put white supremacy as an ism on the population, you are forcing the population to look at another human being within this range. So as a result, the appearance 
does not become the same as the beautiful appearance that would have been in the otherwise. If we call somebody else to be either a Democrat or a Republican in ideology, for example, or to be another form of ism, we are putting them in this range, in this specific range. And as a result, the look is not the normal look that this is supposed to be. You see, what the faith is attempting to do here is attempting to say that the way you are looking at the society, the way you are looking at yourself, has to be all embracing. It has to cover the entire range of the visible spectrum. You shouldn't be focusing on the ultraviolet region or the infrared region, because if that is how you're going to be looking, you are going to see a weird appearance. And that weird appearance does not describe the beauty that is, was meant for us to see. Now, I am going to take this to the level of absurdity. If I go beyond the ultraviolet spectrum and I go to the x-ray, what do you think I'm going to see? I'm going to see the skeleton of this individual who is going to look, make the individual even look weirder than what the beauty that we can see here and the handsomeness that we can see here. And finally, uh, given the fact that I, I'm an engineer and a scientist, I, I have to show you the picture of the sun that is taken at different wavelengths. So for example, again, this is an infrared. So if we look at it with infrared, if we look at it with optical microscope, this is what you and I would see if we just go and look at the sun. Of course, try, please try not to look at it because it will damage your, your eyes. But nevertheless, the sun looks in a very different way if you look at it at different wavelengths. So if I look at it in the UV range, this is what it would look like. And now if I take it to X-ray, that is what it will look like. So you see how reality changes depending on what type of glasses we put on? You remember in the world view when I described, I had the picture of glasses. This is the reason I'm showing you these pictures because glasses are gonna become the filters through which we are gonna be looking at the world. And those filters are gonna de define what the appearance of reality is gonna be. This is what the reality was meant for us to see. This is the reality what was meant for us to see. We were not meant to see the color of the face of another individual. We were not supposed to see the sex of another individual, whether you're a man or a woman. We were not meant to see if a person is a little bit on the heavier side or the lighter side. We were supposed to see a human being. Yes, those are characteristics that we can refer to. However, those are only characteristics. You're not supposed to be characteristics that are going to make us make judgment on other individuals. Please accept my apologies for the verbosity of this presentation. There was a lot of material I had to present here. And I would like to end it at this point. If there are any questions, I uh, would like to open it, open the forum for questions. Yes, so we do have a question. Thank you. Uh, the question is, is there an absolute right or wrong? Or is it relative to the period of human history? Or even in a fixed period, is application of right or wrong, depending on the socioeconomic system of the diverse communities in the world at that time? Right, right, right. This is an, this is an excellent question. Excellent question. Thank you very much for asking that. Actually, if you look at... And I'm going to start from good and bad and then go to right and wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, as far as a human being is concerned, good and bad is going to be relative to what I see. So naturally, I define the boundaries of what is good and what is bad. Then we get to what is right and what is wrong, which as far as we Baha'is are concerned, that is defined by the manifestation of God. So they become like the a stake in the ground relative to whose, be, whose behavior we define what is right and what is wrong. So now you are asking the question, is this right and wrong that the manifestations of God are recommending? Are they absolute or not? So as you can see, basically we have increased the window of time 
The good, and bad, the, the good and bad that I talked about was within the life of an individual. Let's say if I live about 60, 70 years or 80 years, I can define the good and bad relative to what I want. So good and bad is going to have a lifetime of 60, 70, 80 years in my lifetime. Right and wrong relative to the manifestation of God is going to be a much period of time and it takes generations of people. However, look at the human life. Human life is a dynamic entity. There was a time that we lived in the cave. So right and wrong for the caveman was different from the right and wrong of the group of people that lived in a tribe and the right and wrong of the people who live in a nation, the right and wrong of the people who live in a world and the right and wrong of the United Federation of different planets that might exist, let's say 100,000 years from now, and the right and wrong of the Federation of different galaxies that might be coming to being a million years from now, right? Because the frameworks are going to change. There was a time that it was necessary for me to be able to defend myself if I live in a cave. So if there was me and my family, I had the right to murder another person who entered into that cave, right? Now that we live in a society that is culture, the concept has been transferred into the concept of showing justice. And there are other institutions that are supposed to bring justice to my case and bring safety for me. So it is not right for me to just go and defend myself by having a gun. Even though we have people who run around and they say, I, I have a right to you know, carry a gun and whoever comes to my property, I'm gonna kill them. So you see the, po the point I'm attempting to make is that yes, there is an implication of constancy associated with right and wrong, but even that is going to be relative. It is constant within a much larger time span. But given the fact that we have a dynamic life, even that is going to become dynamic in the future. Is the answer clear, the point I'm making? Yes. Um, I, have, I haven't received a response from uh, the person who asked the question, but uh, yes, it is uh, uh, very clear to me. If anyone has uh, uh, questions as to what was just explained, please uh, send that and uh, we can... Uh, you know, continue elaboration. But one, one thing that I think that could uh, use elaboration, so you're saying these, um, these people who bring messages from God, uh, these manifestations of God, such as Jesus or Moses or Muhammad or Baha'u'llah or Buddha, these, these people who uh, uh, brought messages at certain points in time, those were our anchor points of objectivity? That, that is correct. They were, they were the stake in the ground that described what is right and what is wrong. Because for us to be able to behave in a healthy manner within a social environment, we need to have a criteria by which to make a judgment that is going to be acceptable by, by a group, by a larger group. Now imagine if you have a society of 100 people and each one of those 100 people live within their own bubbles where they define what is good and what is bad for each one of them. Mm -hmm. Now you try to make a society of 100 people that think what is good for them, what is bad for them, and you're free to make those choices. Naturally, they are gonna be bound by arms in order to defend what is good and what is bad for each one of them. So that society is not going to be able to function properly. Now, all of a sudden, an individual comes and he says, look at me, follow me, be as I am. Try to behave relative to the set of behavior that I am setting for you as the criteria of judgment. And that is going to take, you know, take the rough edges away and make your life easier to be able to interact with one another. Other than that, what I consider to be good for me might end up to be bad for the next person. 
I might build my house in such a way that is going to infringe upon the rights of my neighbor. Who is there to say what is good or what is bad? Because my good is going to be his bad. But if I'm going to operate, if both of us are going to operate based on what is right and what is wrong, which are the rules and regulations that we accept based on what the city is imposing, what the town is imposing, we are not going to get into a fight. This is an example of, a material example of what I'm attempting to make. So um, <clears throat> we've received uh, two questions that are uh, very similar to one another. Um, the, and, and we will be, again, following up. So uh, please allow me to, after I say the first question uh, and, and we talk a little about it, I come in with the second question. So both of them can be addressed at the same time. So the first question from uh, Regina, she asked, is the challenge of uh, whites and blacks reconciling, um, she had uh, listened to People of the Eye, which is a presenter uh, yesterday, she brought up. Um, she says that when the presenter said that, um, that, that uh, the African-American community can uh, forgive and forget uh, when the whites remember, so they can overcome superiority. Um, I'm going to actually say the second question with it, so to make more sense of this. With the uh, this is from uh, George and Farida Vaya. They were asking, so when the question becomes how to bring this topic up to uh, white supremacists, um, the communists, and religious leaders who have behaved in oppression in order to have them see the need to change their perspective on human existence for the betterment of the world. Uh, what, what is your perspective on that with the modern issues that we have, given the difference, the disparity between treatment of people on the basis of race, as you had just mentioned, we're all human and we have to see each other within the spectrum, not just within what we want to see. Um, what, what is your perspective on this disparity of race in this country, of, uh, you know, different socioeconomic systems people want to impose on one another, uh, and, of course, the religious leaders who want to impose their religion over the world? Correct, correct. Well, um, I mean, in my opinion, in my opinion, the answer to this question is very simple. However, in order to be able to properly consider the solution to this, a change in our worldview is necessary. I'm going to give you an example. We live in the United States. United, in the United States, people are very adamant in regards to the separation of uh, religion and government. People are very adamant in regards to their freedom of doing whatever that they want to do. One of the issues that come up is that in order for us to be able to solve the problem and go from this situation to this situation, we are going to need some form of education. I'm going to take you back to science. In science, we figured out that in order for us to be able to have a better life in the society, it is important for the members of the society to go to school and become educated. Okay? So as a result, education has become mandatory, material, Education has become mandatory for the entire population, okay? And we can see the benefits of that because as people become more educated, they find themselves to be in a better position to get better jobs, to be able to uh, make themselves grow and develop further. One of the things as a result, as a result of a fundamental misunderstanding in this culture is the fact is our fear of two things. Number one, 
that other people are after my freedom, they are, they, are, they are going to take away my freedom. And number two, we have the problem of mixing religion with, uh, mixing religion with government and stuff like that. In my opinion, if they really want to solve this problem of removing these worldviews and going into a new worldview, it is imperative for us to start teaching from basically kindergarten to our children the basic human values. And by basic human values, I mean kindness, sense of justice, sense of honesty, and there is a large list of items that we can, we can talk about. Imagine a society where children are going to be actively taught this fundamental verity of human attributes, or what we in Baha'i faith, we call the attributes of God. We need to overcome our fear of mixing religion with government. It has nothing to do with mixing religion and government. We are talking about if you're living in a society where the members of the community are supposed to have an understanding of justice. Imagine you, live, you have a society where people understand justice. Children, a 24-year-old who goes and gets a job or becomes a member of the Congress or a member of a government has a clear notion of what justice is. And by clear notion, I mean it is a notion of, or, or it's an understanding that like science, it is normalized across the entire population. So in science, we understand one plus one is equal to, and we understand X plus Y in parentheses to the power two is X squared plus Y squared plus two X Y. Everybody knows that, everybody memorizes that, and everybody uses that. We need to understand, we need to have an, a standard way of understanding what justice is. Now imagine if you have a society where you are teaching a young black children, young white children, young Persian children, young Mexican children, young American children, and young, uh, let's say, uh, children from Canada. What justice is, when these people grow older, the same way that they understand mathematics, you're going to understand what justice is all about. These are the people who are going to be ready to have the conversation about removing these barriers and embracing one another. At this point, we are basically kidding ourselves that we are trying to just raise our hands and try to hold our hands, each other's hands. Without removing these barriers, we cannot go here. And in order to remove these barriers, we need to have the right education. And it is, this is why that Baha'u'llah talks about as a part and parcel of the education of children is the spiritual education of children. Now, they argue in the United States that this is something that should be left to parents. If that is the case, why don't we just pull the plug and let allow parents to teach their children how to read and write and then try to have engineers and doctors getting into the society. Good luck with that. If we are going to have luck with that, we are going to have luck with teachers, with parents teaching their children how to have a sense of justice, kindness, and respect. If we can teach this to our children, the problems that we are dealing with in the society are going to go away. Yes. Once again, sorry for repeating myself and sorry for being verbose about it. Well, no, no. I think that uh, that was necessary to describe it. And it was uh, actually not just thorough, but a, a subject in of itself that desires, um, I would desire, uh, demands more time. <laughs> I would desire that. But um, the purpose of uh, today, uh, we were actually supposed to be stopping around 1230. However, we've gone over because of the, uh, well, people had questions and we would try to answer as many as we could. And at the same time, uh, it, it's just really good to answer these questions because I mean, 
we had a, a beautiful subject, which in of itself is good alone, but these points that we discussed, I feel are very important to clarify some of what was meant on the inside. For example, education of children uh, being a way to uh, solve this problem that is so glaring in front of us, you know, educating children about virtue and how to be a good person in society to interact with one another. That's a very, very appropriate point. And it, and in itself, demands a lot more discussion, elaboration, and uh, it's probably a uh, another subject for maybe another time if you would be willing to speak about it. So that being said, uh, from the uh, Baha'i Center of Clearwater, the Baha'is of Clearwater, we want to say thank you so much for uh, giving us your time to talk about this and uh, to be not just thorough on the subject, but giving something that is a point of conversation for so many people, discussing what can we do to make a better world? Well, here's the old worldview and here's the new worldview and here's how we can transition. And you laid out it in a very thorough sense, something that someone else who's watching this can, of course, learn and find how to apply it in their own setting. Now, with that being said, if anyone has questions that have not been answered, please send us a message and we will relay that question to Mr. Akeem and he can uh, expound upon it further and uh, give you some resources to um, start you on your journey, most importantly. That being said, this is again, Baha'i Adult Learning that is available uh, every Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, the same time as it is in New York, United States of America. If you're joining us from uh, afar or if you're joining us from a point in time, this is the recording and it's maybe a year from now, please feel free to go to clearwaterbahais.org, www.clearwaterbahais.org and contact us there, send us a message and tell us um, what it is that you'd like clarification on, and we'll do our best to get back to you as soon as possible. So, uh, Mr. Hakim, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Have a good Bye -bye. day. Bye-bye.